Andrea Guzman and Andrew Lindsay for their outstanding work in helping to develop the series. Today's topic is voting rights. Joining us are Latasha Brown, a thought leader, social strategist, and co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Tomas Lopez, Executive Director of Democracy NC. Mirna Pernez, per Perez, Director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. And Paul Smith, Vice President, Litigation and Strategy at Campaign Legal Center. Professor Guy Charles will moderate. Before turning to our distinguished guest, it seems fitting to take a moment to acknowledge the tremendous work and sacrifice of Congressman John Lewis in this and in other areas. For those of you who are not participating on the panel, we ask that you turn off your audio and video. And if you have questions, please pose them in the chat box. And to the extent that time permits, I will present them to the panel at the end of the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Charles. Thank you, Professor Jones. I appreciate your leadership in organizing this panel, as well as the series um, that is hosted by the center. So what I wanna do before turning it over to the panelists is just to briefly provide and set us up from the, from the legal framework as to why is it that we have um, the intersection of voting problems in this context that intersects with the pandemic. So I just wanna provide um, the barest of legal background to get us going and then I will turn it over to our panelists. So the first thing that I think most people don't recognize is that in the American system, uh, particularly when it comes to federal elections, we really don't have a federal positive right that one can turn to. So we, we rely on the 14th Amendment um, and the 15th Amendment for racial discrimination, but we don't have a, um, a provision in the federal constitution where, where it says, voting is protected as a matter of fundamental positive rights. So I always compare this to the South African constitution that provides that every adult citizen has the right to vote in elections for any legislative body. So the first place to start thinking about is our constitutional framework. Um, the second part related to it is the fact that we have a very decentralized system, as I think most people um, now recognize. And what that means is that every state does, uh, conducts its own elections very differently. Every state has its own set of rules. Um, this decentralization or federalism is a key component of both election law and practice. That authority for, for regulating elections is divided between the states and the federal government, but, it, but even more so, it, it's decentralized at the county level, sometimes at the city level. Um, so localism is an important aspect of our system. So no, it isn't the case that we just have 50 different systems, but in some respects we have hundreds of different systems. Uh, so one county can be doing one thing, but then the county next door is doing something very different. So, right, so that's another thing to take into account. Third, we also have to recognize that we don't really have, we have very few professionals in the system. Uh, and one of the things that we'll talk about in, in this process is how much we rely on um, volunteers to run our election system. And, and many of our volunteers, most of them are retired and older people. And you could begin to see how a pandemic might affect the um, the workers, the folks who are the backbone of our system, who are volunteers and who are older. Um, fourth, voters bear the burden of participation. That is, the government does not take responsibility for registering voters. Um, and of course, it also depends on some states are better at this than others. But as a general matter, we put a lot of burdens on the voters. And then two more. Fifth, um, we have a partisan, partisan administration of elections. So for the most part, individuals who are most ideologically interested are the ones who are making the decisions about um, the rules, about the process, about voting. And then lastly, we depend upon the courts and the judiciary as administrators and enforcers. 
uh, litigation is an important mechanism, in some respects, a primary mechanism by which we resolve and address voting disputes. And so in order to understand as a setup um, where we are today and why we are there to, to, to get us going, so we have to understand those background components of the American election, election system and in some respects that, that makes us unique, um, most of it not in a, not in a great way, um, but, but explain some of the pathologies that we're going to be talking about today. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. And the first, the question that I have for all of them, um, it, from their perspective, one of the things that I would like to know, what is, what is the most pressing voting rights question um, today? So if you're talking to, um, whether it's your staff or your relative, and you're saying, you know, this is the voting issue that we ought to be caring about, um, how, what is the most pressing issue that you have? So um, I'm, I'm just going to go in the order that I see on my screen. So if, I, if I'll start with Mina. Mina, if you would um, tell us from your perspective, what do you see? Sure. Thank you so much, Gene. Thank you so much, Professor uh, uh, Jones, for having me. Uh, if you had asked me three months ago, my answer would have been different. But right now, I will say the most pressing thing for us is to protect our polling places. I think that there are a number of communities for whom uh, vote by mail is not going to be uh, a solution that they use. Um, and uh, given the disproportionate deaths that happen from COVID, we want to make sure that those people who are voting in person, which are probably going to be people of color, are able to do so safely and sanitarily. And that cannot happen if they're highly congested because too many of them were closed or consolidated. Thank you, Mina. Um, Tomas, what about you from your perspective? Sure. Uh, one thing I would, I would add to the conversation is the story around expectations. Uh, I think that there are there's a situation we're in this year where our election is going to look different in many places than people are used to. You know, the the uh, here in North Carolina, we are expecting far more people to cast absentee by mail ballots than in previous elections. And uh, you look at states around the country where that is the case, you are going to see a real possibility that we don't know election results on election night. And what that means is that uh, there is going to be I think an unfortunate opportunity, depending on how all this gets framed, for people to be, begin questioning elections, for uh, people to get um, sort of upset, undermine results. And I do think there's a lot of work for us to do, not just in protecting access to the ballot, but in making sure that we've got uh, the most kind of stable, smooth post-election period possible. Thank you. Paul, what about you? Well, I, I guess I would point to the kinds of problems we've seen in a lot of primaries. Uh, it seems quite clear that a number of these disparate jurisdictions you talked about, he, are simply not ready to conduct a, an election where most of the voting will be by mail. Uh, the ballots will not get to the people in time. If they are, uh, do get voted, they, they may not get back in time to the, to the election officials. And what, what all of this means is you're going to have potentially vote suppression en masse caused by simply the lack of organization and lack of resources, which then pushes back uh, onto the polling place problem that Myrna talked about, because people who don't get their absentee ballot in time uh, or are worried that the, the, the ballot will not get back in time will start going to find places to vote in person on election day, and they may not find very many, and you'll end up with massive lines. Particularly, uh, in some cases, it seems likely that those lines will uh, be in some parts of the city or some parts of the state much more than others, and that could have a discriminatory impact as well. So the two kind of dovetail, the, the voting by mail and the voting in person, and the states and, and counties of this country do not give me any confidence that they're ready to, to handle this. Thank you. Natasha. So, you know, I, I, I did all everything that's been said before. Um, I, I actually want to put it in the frame of racism. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, as you were um, counting the things um, the, that were related to kind of more the administrative, the structure, the framework of voting, that part of what is also embedded in the culture of voting in this country is structural racism. And so that there's always been this fight for access to the ballot that has been distinctively different from a voting experience from a person of color and a white person in this country. And so what that looks like um, 
there will be voters suppression, just as was previously stated, that will be related to, I just think that the, the cities, the, the local, the state, um, the government is not prepared for it. Part of it, the, pre the lack of preparation goes back to what I think is underneath that, um, there is an element of structural racism and an intentionality around it as well. Um, there's also an element of, oh, well, we're just, you know, uh, an element of the cities are just not used to operating, um, election officials are not used to operating under these conditions, these set of conditions. Um, in addition to that, I also think that there are a, when we, there's a spectrum of voter suppression I think we're going to deal with. We're going to deal with some of them, that it, uh, 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 element of it that is specifically tied into the administration uh, and the preparation. Uh, to part intentionally and unintentionally. I think we're also going to deal with voter suppression in the form of misinformation and disinformation. We've been seeing a lot of that that's directed at certain communities. And three, I think there is an element um, that's going to really, uh, that we're already seeing to suppress the vote by creating a culture of fear um, and a culture of confusion. And so I'll just, I'll stop there. Okay, that's a that's a great summary. So, right? so um, just so for our, our listeners to really understand how these things are interacting, the absence of centralized authority, the absence of predictable rules, presents a number of different types of opportunities that are related to intentional as well as unintentional effects on voters, and all, also presents an opportunity for the in it for race and um, both disparate impact as well as intentional racism, right? So our election structure, um, the decentralized aspect of it, the lack of clear and predictable rules, the lack of a um, central regulatory authority, the lack of um, the absence of a federal constitutional provision by which we can point to and say, no, voting is a fundamental right. And so these types of things the government must do um, facilitates the types of uh, discriminatory practices as well as maladministration practices that a number of our panelists have pointed to. All right, so now let me turn to some more specific questions. And I'll start with you, Tomas, um, thinking about North Carolina and the development of voting rights in the state. Can you tell us a bit about, um, from your perspective in North Carolina, what you've seen as some of the egregious actions in the state, as well as some of the things that uh, the state has done well and its impact on vulnerable groups, uh, Latinx communities, folks of color, uh, poor people. Um, so tell us a bit more about the state in which we find ourselves. Sure, thank, and thank you, Professor Charles. And I actually wanna start by adding on a little bit to uh, the background that you shared at the top, which is about the American uh, election administration system, right? We've got 50 different states. We have all these jurisdictions that run and manage elections in their own way. Uh, and from you uh, look at from 1965 until 2013, you know, we had the full protections of a federal statute, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that was monitoring the activities of all these jurisdictions. And it was during that time that there were thousands of jurisdictions that before they could change anything about their voting laws, and that included much of North Carolina, including anything statewide in North Carolina, those changes had to be either approved by either a three-judge federal panel or the U.S. Department of Justice. And so, you know, there are a number of dates that you can point to about, you know, why is so much happening now? But you can't tell that story without telling that story that, you know, 2013. And the ways in which, you know, the Voting Rights Act prevents discriminatory actions in voting, right? Discriminatory voting laws. And we still have a private right of action under the Voting Rights Act. The federal government can still bring investigations and lawsuits under the Voting Rights Act. But the loss of the preventative measures uh, because of the structure of the decision Shelby County versus Holder allowed states like North Carolina in 2013, days after that ruling, to put forward legislation that, in the case of North Carolina, put in place a strict photo ID requirement eliminated a week of early voting, eliminated the ability for voters to register to vote during that early voting period. The list goes on. And North Carolina wasn't alone in doing this, right? Texas passed a strict photo ID law that included measures as originally written where you could uh, cast a ballot with a, uh, a concealed handgun permit, but not a student ID, 
You look at Wisconsin that passed the strict photo ID requirement. You look at attacks on early voting in states throughout the country during the past decade. And what we know is just as, and, and I think Latasha put it really well, you can't tell the story of voting in this country, voting regulation in this country without telling the story of race. And the fact that race has been one of the primary barriers and, and uh, things that have existed to basically say, look, you can vote if you're this way, you can vote if you can't vote if you're not this way. And uh, that goes back to, that does not go, it goes a lot farther back than 2013, it goes a lot farther back than 1965. Um, so this is not a new phenomenon at all. Uh, courts have, uh, in many, in some cases, been very skeptical of these attempts. In North Carolina, the Fourth Circuit rejected the uh, the 2013 omnibus law. Uh, held, in fact, that a legislature here acted with what the court called almost surgical precision in uh, the ways in which that statute was shaped. In doing so, it cited the legislature's use of race-based data in tailoring the provisions of its law. And there are similar discriminatory intent findings that the courts have found over the years. At the same time, we are still operating in an environment where particularly in the federal courts, you have uh, a good deal of skepticism toward voting rights. I think we've seen some decisions in recent months uh, you know, that again, give folks concern about what the picture will look like. I think I would, I'd wanna highlight three categories of voting restriction. You know, one are restrictions on the act of voting. So you think about photo ID, strict photo ID requirements that say in order to cast a ballot, you need to present a particular form of ID. The second thing I would point to, and we're not gonna talk about that here, that's a whole other set of things, but the in, uh, restrictions on the impact of voting. I think a lot of, you know, we point to with uh, the most extreme forms of gerrymandering speak to that. And North Carolina, again, is another example of where that's taken place. And third are things that affect, and put barriers on the road to voting, restrictions on voter registration. So for instance, a wave of laws we saw earlier this decade that made it more difficult for people to register to vote in the first place and you needed to provide proof of citizenship. And uh, this is also not, and I'll end with this, this is also not a static picture, right? So it's not just this fusillade of, of bad things coming down, right? There are people that are working really hard throughout the country to make good things happen, to expand voting access but those also, you know, like, uh, like many good deeds, they have not gone unpunished. And I think one of the things that we'll probably hear about in this conversation is the work that's been going on in Florida since the massive rights restoration efforts that have been going on there, the pushback that has happened in the litigation that's been ongoing. And so I think one thing to really convey to everybody who's watching or listening is that in fact, this is a, a fluid picture. It's not all negative, but for every positive, you know, there has been pushback. So, and I'll leave it there. And and again, kind of reinforce the centrality of race in this conversation. The fact that we are talking often about black and brown voters, we are talking about issues like language access, we are talking about issues, when we, especially when we talk about felony disenfranchisement, who ends up being affected by that. And so people should kind of continue to hold that center as we talk about that. And, and as we talk about the impact of the coronavirus and the ways in which it's disproportionately impacted communities of color as well. Thank you, Tomas. Um, Latasha, I'm going to turn to you and I'm going to ask you in particular about what you are seeing on the ground um, and how the pandemic and voting are interacting um, and what you can tell us about your experiences uh, on the ground with respect to both voting and the pandemic. pandemic. So it has been a, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a new ball game for all of us. It has been extremely challenging um, of what we've witnessed uh, one, there has been a, particularly in the last election cycle, so I'm going to use two elections, I'm going to, uh, that Black Voters Matter, that we were there and supported voters and witnessed. Um, I'll start with Georgia, which is my home state, my current home state. So we went in, in Georgia a couple of weeks ago, as we know, it was a, a colossal failure, but just in my experience alone, it took me three hours to vote in my polling site. We were asked to assist a um, a well-known um, rapper who wanted to um, go in and out of the polls and wanted us to assist him, but he, he lived in a majority uh, white district, which is like a 98% white district. And so we go over, I go over the town to assist him in voting, and it may have been 10 minutes. It was no lines, there were no anticipation. It, it so much so that I thought I was at the wrong place um, because there was just no 
um, it was it was just so seamless. Um, and then I was called back to a black polling site, a site in an, a, a district again, which is over 90% African American. And I get to that district, it is about 1 p.m. And people had been waiting in line for over six hours. There was a line wrapped around the uh, wrap, around the building. Most people said that they had been sitting there. They had chairs. They had chairs lined up for people to sit, for elders to wind up sitting. This is in, in the midst of COVID-19. In addition to that, um, the, line, the machines that the state of Georgia just paid $102 million to purchase um, were not turned on and this particular site till 12 o'clock noon, even though the polls open up at seven. Um, again, later on that night, I had to do something on, uh, I had to do a Lawrence O'Donnell show. And while I was on the show, I got my phone kept blowing up and I get a phone call that there were 300 African-American voters in a district. Once again, this is after 1030 PM um, that were waiting in line in Union City that needed assistance. And so our team went out, there were some other groups that went out just to encourage and, and um, people and support people as they stand in line. I did not arrive until 11 o'clock. Once I get there, we waited with, with voters until 1240. And so the experience, this is the same, this is all in Metro Atlanta. So the experience that, and before I went to the other black site, there was another white polling site, majority white polling site, that the the uh, it uh, the wait time was around 15 minutes maybe so that black side now. In addition to that, so we saw these major um, describe the differences between certain polling sites and where they were located and who lived in those communities because they forgot to take the cords. Um, these are just new machines. And some places they had enough cords. And so, and part of even the, the state, the Secretary of State's response, I think still rooted in structural racism that in some way, um, and, and, and in many ways, that was an underlying kind of message around that. The second thing is, I, I, a couple weeks later, we go to Kentucky. In K Kentucky and Louisville, um, and there is a, all of the polling sites, the Democratic governor and the Republican sector of state decided to have one polling site um, in Louisville. The interesting thing about that is in Louisville and Jefferson County, the majority of the African-American population, 50% of the population for the entire state live in that one county. And so you had one polling site uh, with 12 machines, with one polling site, for, to service 612,000 voters. And so consistently what we saw, even in the primary election, um, is this, um, it, it feels like an, an, an intentionality of to make sure that the preparation in some ways, it, if, if there is to be preparation around on election day, there's far more attention paid to white and Republican voting sites than there are other sites that have primarily either people of color um, voters or um, uh, Democratic leaning voters. In addition to that, so you have all of this going on on election day, upcoming election, part of what happened is hundreds of people that we met, including my nephew, who had applied for a mail-in ballot, never received them, including Stacey Abrams, and which why we were forced to go to the polls and vote. He stand, stood in line on early voting for six hours. And so the experience for African-American and people of color is almost dramatic just to go to the polls, just to vote, you know, and it's interesting because many of these folks are essential workers or they're hourly workers. So to have that kind of loot, that loss of time has a significant financial burden on us as well. In addition to that, what we saw how we've been in this, in this process, we've had to really talk to people around the uh, mail-in voting. Um, there's a lot of distrust on the ground around mail-in voting. As, as it should be, that what we do know is that the rejection rate for African Americans documented for African American voters and people of color voters is much higher uh, mail-in voting than it is in-person voting. And so there's a lot of concern from black voters that we've been talking about, talking to, who don't simply don't trust the process as well. However, even when they're going to vote early, 
in the early voting process, we're still running into some of the same problems. So that's where the part of where the intersection of, you know, how much of this is resulting from a lack of preparation and how much of this is really around an intentionality up to discourage voters. In that's addition, very, yeah. I'm gonna say that's very helpful. I wanna say, I, I, I'm gonna um, hold for a moment because I want the panel to help us think about solutions to these questions, particularly we've talked about a, a little bit the trade-off between in-person voting and mail-in, and we're seeing that there are problems with both. Uh, so for example, Latasha, you, you mentioned the difficulty of um, long lines and all of the questions that are involved with, the problems that are involved with um, in-person. But of course, there are also problems with mail-in ballots, people are requesting ballots and not getting them on time. Uh, and we also haven't talked about um, how states might deal with ballots that, are, that they receive after, that are postmarked after the election day or that they receive after election day, right? So there are questions as to both and I want us to, to think about it. I want to come back to that in, in a moment. Paul, I want to go to you and then I'll go to Mirna and I'll, I'll come back, I'll come right back to you, Latasha, in, in a moment. Um, and to help us think about litigation, um, too, before we start thinking about solution. Both of you are litigators uh, involved in a number of these questions. You both were involved in the Florida um, um, litigation dealing with felony dis felon disenfranchisement. So if we could talk about that as well as the role of litigation um, as a possible remedy for uh, the types of questions that we're worried about in November. Sure. So before um, I, I get to the Florida story and, and, and the felon issue, um, litigation is going on right now all over the country trying to make the vote by mail system better. Uh, and one of the things we're doing is trying to go to places which do have uh, systems of rejecting ballots uh, based on a perceived signature mismatch between the signature on the ballot and the signature on file and saying, you can't just do that without giving people notice and an opportunity to cure. Uh, and a number of states are moving in that direction. Also, there's an issue of a quick moment. What, what, and so the point, the problem that you're pointing to is a, sign, is a signature mismatch that's causing right. The, right. the rejection, just to, to make it that clear for... Right. For, for, and and, and yeah. as states have moved to voting by mail in the primary, we've, we've seen very significant, uh, as Latasha mentioned, percentages of re rejection. Uh, percentages which are too high by any rational standard. But if you don't tell people that they didn't vote, you don't give them a chance to fix it, that's, that's a real problem. And then there are some states where you need to have uh, witnesses, uh, maybe get your ball ballot notarized. That doesn't work well for people who are trying to self-isolate in the middle of a pandemic. And so there's litigation going on about that as well. There will be more litigation about this problem of the ballots being late uh, with efforts to try to change the deadlines uh, we saw that with the Wisconsin primary, it went up to the United States Supreme Court. I would expect efforts to try to change the deadline from having the ballot received by election day, maybe having it postmarked by election day. Uh, th those things are going to be going on right up to election day this year because the states are not going to be ready. Uh, all that said, there, then there's this issue uh, highlighted in Florida of whether people with, with prior felony convictions uh, ought to be allowed to vote. And, the problem of felon disenfranchisement has been around this country a long time. It's actually been upheld as constitutional by the Supreme Court. It's actually referred to in the 14th Amendment uh, as a basis for disqualifying people from voting. Uh, it became uh, part of the structural racism of our system around the time of the, uh, the around 1900 when the white power structure was, was taking power back in the South uh, and the Jim Crow regime was, was taking hold. Uh, they use felon disenfranchisement along with grandfather clauses and literacy tests and these other things to try to make sure that there were sufficient barriers to prevent African Americans from voting in these southern states. Uh, we have a case in Alabama about their system of felon disenfranchisement where they, the, the standard was it has to be a crime of moral turpitude, but they didn't tell you what that meant. And it was up to the county clerks to decide whose crime had moral tur turpitude. It was designed to, to keep black people from voting. Uh, and the sort of lead felon disenfranchiser of all is uh, Florida. Florida, unlike Alabama, didn't selectively uh, ban it. If you had a felony conviction, uh, you were out uh, essentially for life. You could theoretically get a governor's clemency, but that, that doesn't work uh, in practice in Florida. And so the people of Florida rose up in 
2018 passed Amendment 4 said, we're going to let this 1.4 million people in our population have their right to vote restored. As soon as they're done with their sentence and their punishment, uh, they should be able to vote. They've paid their debt to society. But what immediately arose was the issue of what about people who have gotten out of prison but still owe fines or restitution or the, the other weird fees that you pick up when you go through the criminal justice system to pay your probation officer, to pay training fees, to pay the prosecutors, all these things end up on your tab. And a very high percentage of those 1.4 million people have fines and fees uh, that they simply can't afford to pay. Uh, and the state said, well, that's, that means you haven't finished your sentence. You shouldn't be able to vote. And so a lot of groups, including mine uh, and uh, Nirna's, uh, uh, brought litigation saying you can't keep people from voting because they're too poor to pay the fines and fees. That, that's got to be unconstitutional wealth discrimination. Uh, and we ended up with a tremendous decision after a full trial by Zoom uh, in, front of, in federal court uh, in uh, Tallahassee. Uh, and Judge Hinkle had made three basic holdings about the situation that exists now in the wake of Amendment 4 in Florida. One is wealth discrimination of this kind, uh, treating people differently in access to the franchise based on whether they have money to pay their fines and fees or they don't, is unconstitutional discrimination in, in access to a fundamental interest, the right to vote. He said, as to these other fees, these are just basically just taxes. Uh, and you can't tie a tax to the right to vote. Under the 24th Amendment, a poll tax is unconstitutional for whether you can afford to pay it or not. And so he, said, he said, that's just, you cannot use access to voting as a way to enforce these charges on people uh, without violating the 24th Amendment. And then he said, there's a third problem in Florida, which is for a, a large percentage of these people, the state can't even tell you what you owe or if you owe. Uh, and so the, the system is set up in such a way that these people were going to be waiting years and years to find out what the tab is, what they have to do. And so the judge uh, put in place a system that said, if you ask the state what you owe and they, they don't tell you in 21 days, then you have safe harbor. All these things were designed to fix a problem that had been created when uh, Amendment 4 was passed. Uh, and it was all... Um, just a week or two ago, uh, stayed by the 11th Circuit on Bonk uh, without any explanation whatsoever about, as they were taking what was called initial on Bonk review. That means that the, the entire 11th Circuit will all hear this appeal initially themselves as, as a large group. Uh, and so it, it is uh, it's unfortunate, I think, that nobody's able to take advantage of this injunction that we won. Uh, from Judge Hinkle and uh, the, the, the whole situation looks like it, you know, whether we, we have a very accelerated appeal, maybe, maybe there's some hope for relief in September, but it's, it's, a, it's a long struggle to try to get the right to vote meaningfully restored for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the state of Florida. That, that's helpful, Paul, because it points to both how litigation is useful, but also its limitations. So I'm going to go to Mina. <laughs> Um, to tell us about her efforts um, as well. And then I'll come back uh, to Latasha. Uh, so Mirna, if you would tell us about um, your efforts and the role that, of litigation um, in addressing some of the issues that we're worried about in November um, and what you think are its potential as well as its possibilities. Sure. So uh, it's gonna be very surprising for a professor of election law to tell a bunch of law students that uh, I'm not betting on the courts to save us right now. I think that uh, it's always challenging and always hard to bring election cases at the uh, close to an election because of some doctrine that I'm sure Professor Charles and Professor Jones have taught you about before uh, called Purcell. Um, and for that reason, I am, uh, my team and I are working really hard to also pursue non-litigation advocacy efforts. And I think that this is really important because one of the things that happens, I think, in law school is that students go into law school with lots of options and then they walk out of it thinking that because they have a hammer, everything is a nail. Um, and I, my hope for all the students is that uh, you approach law school as expanding your options. And so some of the things that the Brennan Center is working on in order to make sure that we leave no voters behind 
Because to Latasha's point, let's be very clear, the voters that are going to be left behind or the voters that are always being left behind is to look at the ecosystem of voting. And at every different pipeline, we're seeing a problem that is going to be compounded by uh, COVID. So the first one we've talked about a bit is polling places. We've already discussed why we still need them. Um, we've discussed who uses them. We need to make sure that we have enough of them and that they're safe and that they're sanitary so that when people go and vote, they are not getting sick and also that people are not deterred. That means on the ground advocacy to make sure that we have enough polling places, uh, that there's PPEs and sanitary uh, sanitizing uh, equipment um, and that we have enough poll workers. Um, I hope that all of uh, the folks on this call will consider um, contributing to their country by signing up to be a poll worker because we are hearing directly from election officials that the reason they're closing down polling locations is because they don't have the poll workers to manage them. The second issue is expanded early voting opportunities. Why do we want this? Because we do not want people crushing uh, around on election day. Um, we need to smooth out the congestion. We need to make it so that people are able to have enough time that way they can spend six feet away from each other when they're waiting in line, if they have to be waiting in line. Um, this is really critical because we want to, uh, people's lives are complicated. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of disruption and voters need to be able to balance the many things that they are trying to balance. Um, while going to the polls, and that should include expanded early voting. Then obviously universal access to vote by mail. Not everybody's gonna take advantage of it, but everybody that can vote safely from home should vote from home. Um, uh, right now we have about 10 states that look like they're not gonna let everybody vote from home in November. Um, and that's gonna be a problem because some of those states are states that have already demonstrated their inability to keep uh, uh, this, their, their, their voters safe during, while voting during a pandemic. There are also some of those states, for example, Texas, that are putting lots of barriers and have been putting barriers in front of the ballot box for decades. The next, uh, the next bucket, the bucket that of advocacy that we're working on is voter registration. And this is super, super important. We have people turning 18 every day in this country. We have people naturalizing every day in this country. What we don't have is those folks funneling themselves into our democratic process because the mechanisms that we usually use to get them involved are effectively mothballed. Uh, many of you may be surprised to learn that most people in this country register to vote by going to a motor vehicle office. Well, many motor vehicle offices across the country were closed for months. Some of them are still closed. Um, people are also used to seeing like enterprising young people in brightly colored t-shirts, uh, going around festivals with clipboards, asking people to sign up to register to vote if you haven't. We're not having festivals and nobody wants to get close enough to each other to be able to hand over an application to sign it. There are some states in this country that are purging voters faster than they are registering voters. And because um, we know who these non-registered people are going to be, um, there are people uh, just turning 18, newly naturalized citizens, movers, there are constituencies that will not be represented in our democracy where we critically need to leverage the expertise and experience of all of us. So we're going to be the country because so many of us are going to be shut out if we don't figure out how we're going to register um, the unregistered but eligible people in this country. Um, and finally, there's the public education piece. Um, as Latasha mentioned, we have active misinformation. Um, many of you may have heard that like the city of uh, Washington, D.C. sent out mailers to uh, its folks with the wrong primary date on it. Nobody was doing it on purpose. They just were moving too quickly. They didn't have the resources. Nobody stopped to check and voters got the wrong information. Um, but then we also have foreign cyber criminals and actual active suppressors who are purposely trying to distort the information that is out there about voting. You know what fixes both of those things? The misinformation the misinformation by sloppiness or the misinformation by systemic racism and the active disinformation campaign and a whole lot of it by trusted members of the community by sources that people find reliable we're able to shore up 
all of these things, we will minimize the number of voters that are left behind. Um, I also want to just talk about the way um, the way we do need to be mindful of the systemic racism that happens in our process. At some point, we're going to say that the neglect that happens by people not being prepared, by not accounting for the needs of their community, uh, is something that we need to address. Uh, the Brennan Center did a recent study where we looked at long lines in uh, polling places in 2018. We found that uh, Latino and African American voters waited in longer lines than white voters, and they waited in the longest of lines. We also found, and this was the part that I thought was super interesting, that communities that were undertaking or undergoing uh, dramatic demographic shifts had fewer resources per voter. So if your community was getting less white and more poor, you had fewer resources per voter. And that didn't hold um, as a statistical matter um, on a countywide level for stable communities, even stable minority communities. But what this tells me is that the political sphere of our world or of our country is not responding rapidly enough to emerging electorates, to changing demographics. They are putting their heads in the sand about the browning of America, and they are not doing what they need to do to have, but instead trying to do business as usual for a country that we know has at best been inadequate and uh, at worst is actively trying to let some people participate and some people not. Thank you. Latasha, I know that you wanted to um, address some points uh, with respect to discrimination and the pandemic. So I wanna, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to come back and address those and then we're gonna go to Tomas. So it's just, uh, just, just quickly, I, you know, one of the things that happened on the ground that I also, um, I wanted to mention, but I want to go back to the comments that were just made too, um, that we met on election day in Kentucky, there were voters who were trying to vote in the primary, but had received a, a letter that they had uh, registered as Republicans before. And so, and they had never registered Republicans in their closed primary, so they couldn't vote in the, the Democratic primary, but they were offered to be able to get provisional ballots. So one of the things that we've also been noticing in particularly some of the Southern states, and we saw this in Georgia as well, that all of those ballots that were placed in Georgia at when the, the, when the, um, uh, when the machines were quote down, um, were provisional ballots. The problem is in many of the states, provisional ballots are not automatically counted. So some of those ballots are literally almost like going through an activity unless there's a reason, um, unless there's a circumstance. But the, the, the challenge is this whole notion of having people, oh, just use a provisional ballot, right? It's not necessarily, uh, it's also another form of voter suppression. I just wanted to raise that, but I, the, the, the quick points I wanted to make is um, of many of the cases that were raised, we've been a part of it. We're actually suing the state of, we're using litigation as one of the strategies as well. We're suing the state of Georgia um, because they didn't provide poll I mean, uh, uh, postage for voting in the primaries. Um, they're saying that they will in the, um, we're, 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 we're fighting that they will in the, in the general election, um, but that we don't have a ruling on that yet. We don't have any guarantee on that yet. But, but we also see that as a, as a poll tax. I was also a part of the process in Alabama around the more turpitude issue and was one of the people that started the Alabama um, a Coalition to Restore the Vote. And I can tell you the reason why I'm raising that is that even if we get a remedy, a temporary remedy from the court, there's two things. Do we get repair? Does the repair actually happen? And two, in, this, in, in the process, I think part of the reason why voter suppression is so rampant is because there's no accountability measures. That if someone steals the election, like we saw in Georgia, if someone are bad actors, they essentially get a slap on the hand, a they essentially get a bad um, headline, but there's really nothing in place that actually holds them accountable. Yet, we've also been able to see how these wrote that organizations, we saw this in Tennessee, where the legislature actually passed a bill that those who were registering that organizations who were doing voter registration that was actually severely limiting and making vulnerable nonprofit organizations to prevent them from registering um, voters in that state. We also saw in Alabama, which I was a part of, 
um, around that where some of the voters, when we're talking about voter fraud, they would intentionally go after black African-American um, and people of color, particularly African-American voters or registrars who had been doing work. There's a woman sitting in a jail right now um, in, in, in Mississippi that I would love to share more about um, how she is, we got two cases of people that were working with in Mississippi. There's a woman right now who's running for the Board of Electors that today we're actually helping to move her. She's on a, she's living on someone's land on a trailer that she's been on for 20 years. She was, a, she was on the Board of Electors. She is, uh, she started, she ran again. She's ran, running now. Um, she was actually told that she has to vacate the property and um, in her vacating the property, she's convinced that it has something to do with her running for an, an electoral, um, on the board of elections. And these rural counties, who is actually, and this is a county that is 70% black, but the majority of the board of electors are white. And so that there's a dynamic that I'm raising that even when we're talking about legal remedy, if it is not combined with community organizing and the shift of the culture and an accountability that's led by citizens, what we're finding is that it falls flat. We just saw, we've been seeing the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, make a ruling just, just like we saw in just spoken about in Florida, same consideration. When you don't have, if, you, if we place all of our value, if we place all of our trust um, in the, the legal what happens when you, when you have a weaponized against organization alignment with those who are doing work on the ground so that there is a there is a citizens cry out that there is a larger cultural shift and that we when we're thinking about just immediate remedy that oftentimes that does not go far enough thank you that is extremely helpful Tomas um, I'd like to bring you back in and then I have a question from uh, my colleague Lawrence Baxter that I will pose to the to the panel so from your perspective, Tomas, um, what are the types of remedies? Uh, Mina has helpfully addressed some, some issues, uh, public education, more poll workers, expand early voting, uh, universal access to vote by mail. Um, what are some of the things that you, from your perspective, you'd like to bring to the table? So one, one thing I would pull up is to pull together some, some of the stuff that Latasha was just speaking about with some of the framing that we had at the beginning we were talking about uh you know all the different ways in which our election system is really sort of happening and managed at the local level and that when we often think about organizing in the election context we think about well we have to organize people to go to the polls we have to organize people to get good information but in fact there are opportunities and again this depends on where you live but there are opportunities to organize around the election process itself to defend voting rights before people go and cast ballots. And in North Carolina, there's one really good example that is happening right now. Uh, the most popular form of voting in this state, again, outside of the pandemic context, is early in-person voting. 61% of North Carolinians cast their ballots uh, in the 2016 general election during the 17-day early voting period that includes same-day registration. Our state law is set up here where every one of North Carolina's 100 counties has a board of elections that has to take an affirmative vote on where early voting happens and whether it's available on weekends. And so when we talk about the importance of things like an early voting period, about precinct location, about the availability of weekend voting, about uh, souls of the polls drives we hear about you know, in the faith community. In fact, the availability of those things can sometimes turn on decisions that are made at the local level where people come in together and it doesn't necessarily take a lot can end up having outsized influence. And so one of the things that you know, we're engaged in right now is monitoring these activities in counties throughout the state, trying to affect these processes to make sure that people have voting available right on the college campus, at the church in the black community, at the community center, on Saturdays, on Sundays. And so there is a, there is a window uh, 
that, there, that is going to be happening, right? Mirna pointed out precinct consolidation is one of the key issues for us to be concerned about, right? Where voting is going to happen and places going to, and where places end up closing. Well, if polling places are going to end up closing this fall because of a lack of poll workers, right? Let's, let's fast forward it to that. That, that. that local board of elections or that local election manager is going to be making some kind of decision about what's the place that ends up closing. What's the place that if three places close, what's the one that replaces them? These are all opportunities for potential influence to pull together the organizing and, again, sort of the pre-election uh, accessibility issues that we're trying to get at. Hmm. That is very helpful. And I'm going to come back later on to um, challenges to organizing and the pandemic and what that means. But now let me turn to a question on partisanship. Uh, and it'll bring Paul and Mana back on the table, to the table. And the, this question, um, so here's one way of phrasing it. I'll phrase it in two different ways. So I'll just read the, the question and I'll also phrase it from a larger perspective. I'm becoming increasingly concerned about a growing propaganda threat and local GOP meetings and on social media. Uh, the meme, America is not a democracy, it is a republic, is often posted by Republicans. I suspect that this is for, so for two reasons, in order to de delegitimize attempts to sustain voting rights and as a subtle method of privileging the Republican Party over the Democratic Party. The dichotomy is ridiculous, but it's particularly attractive uh, to um, people on the right wing who lack or don't care about the historical development of democracy within our republic. Uh, so, so that's the specific question. I also want to add a larger component to it, which is how do we address the fact that there's sort of there's an asymmetry uh, between the parties on questions of voting and political participation, uh, right? Because by recognizing that asymmetry, we essentially politicize voting and political participation. And then by politicizing it, then turning into a partisan issue, um, that also reinforces and makes it harder to get the type of voting reforms that one would want. So um, particularly in, in your work, how do you think about the partisanship aspect to the, we've, talk, we've talked about the racial aspect, both intentionality as well as systemic, uh, but we haven't squared on addressed the partisanship point. So how do you address that point? How do you think about it? With respect to the specific question that I've posed as well as the broader uh, general problem. So I'll start with you, Paul, and then turn right to you, Mana. Well, as you know, at the Campaign Legal Center, um, our uh, percept our image as a, as, as a nonpartisan organization is an enormously important part of our work and our effectiveness. And so we try hard not to be viewed as simply on one, one partisan side. And in, in, in areas like campaign finance, that's not that hard because there's, there's equal opportunity abuse that goes on with respect to super PACs and things like that. But it is true, I think, now that on the, in the issue of vote suppression, we do have a partisan divide with the Republicans uh, taking the position that if everybody votes, they'll be worse off and that they need to shrink the electorate. And that terminological issue that was referred to in the question is a reflection of that. The, uh, the Republicans on the Hill simply will not use the word democracy in any uh, public statement. They only use the word republic in reference to this country. And I think what that is, is a, is a way of giving themselves um, some leeway to uh, say we are, it is, it is consistent with American values to design the electorate and, and not have everybody just willy-nilly able to vote. Uh, and uh, we see this uh, with, with repeated statements that have been made about voting by mail is, is too, uh, is going to let too many people vote. It is a challenge, but it's a challenge that activists simply have to meet by focusing on what the fight is about and not using partisan rhetoric. Because it doesn't, as you say, it may, it may be counterproductive to start, start telling people that the reason why you're doing this is partisanship, just, you just take on the fight and say, no, you need to have access to the vote. Everybody needs to be able to vote. Everybody's the same. And, and as an activist organization, that, um, that way of doing it, rather than trying to turn the rhetoric into partisan rhetoric, I think is more effective uh, and makes the courts feel like they, that you're doing this for the right reasons. And, that, and you know, even the courts can get caught up in this partisan language if, if you argue it all out that way. And so we try not to do that. Thank you. Nana? Um, I'm going to say a couple of things. I mean, first, uh, most Americans believe in the importance of the fundamental right to vote. Most Americans do not want to see their politicians behaving like children fighting over the same cookie. Um, and most Americans 
uh, want free, fair, and accessible elections. And the problem that we're having is when you have very high placed um, politicians um, with large megaphones trying to signal to their base what they should be thinking. One of the things that we are seeing that is happening right now is that folks are not buying it. Like, despite the fact that um, some folks with very big megaphones keep talking about vote by mail, vote by mail is still very popular and in poll after poll after poll, majority of Americans want it as an access, uh, want it to be accessible, or considering using it. So, um, what we need to guard against, in addition to the stuff that Paul said, is the fact that there will be some segment of voters that get turned off just by the unseemliness of it. Like, you know, even if it's a lie, even if it's been debunked, the fact that some politician is actually being so selfish and craven about their job security that they're willing to, uh, to spread about uh, uh, our voting um, is going to make some people not want to vote. So what I what I'm always trying to do and what I always try to do is something that I think most of the groups here do is focus on the values, focus on the positive, focus on we can't let, um, you know, your right to vote is important or otherwise other people wouldn't be trying to stop it uh, or trying to block you. Um, and I also think that when we vote, we need to be uh, electing politicians that uh, respect the right to vote believe in the right to vote, believe in the way that we have set up uh, a, a peaceable transition of power, um, and, and, and try to provide legitimacy to it rather than... Now, having said that, I certainly don't want to like uh, launder <laughs> the, the problems that are happening in our election system. We really are like staring down a crisis. If we do not make dramatic reforms, very, very quickly, it's going to be a hot mess in November. But we can do something about it. It's not too late. And we can all be part of the solution. There is something that every single person on this phone, on this call can do to improve our system of elections, to bring more people in. Uh, you know, if you don't want to do geo TV, fine. You know, why don't you adopt somebody in your community, in your family, in your your parish who is not registered to vote and help them walk through an application process. Uh, you know, if you don't want to travel across the country to monitor polls, be a poll worker in your neighborhood. Um, there is something that all of us can do. And when we are all invested in our electoral system, we're going to get better results. Um, a very, very, very easy way to start is to call your Congress members right now and to tell them that you want $4 billion uh, being dispersed to states and localities for the run for the running of an election. Nobody has to leave. You can send an email. It doesn't matter if your congressperson is a Democrat or a Republican. They both both parties need to hear this. So is there something that we can all do to try and protect ourselves against the forces that would try to keep um, our government for themselves? Very helpful. Uh, Latasha, if I'd like to bring you back and, and build on something that you said that Tomas is built on as well as Mina which is um, the importance of on the ground organizing um, and how it's core to legitimacy. So I would uh, appreciate it if you would also talk about what are the challenges to on the ground organizing in this time period um, and how are you overcoming those challenges? And some of that I'm sure is uh, participating with us on a call while you're on your organizing from one jurisdiction to another in the car. So you're very efficient without a doubt. But, uh, but if you would, uh, wouldn't mind saying a few words about that, we would appreciate it. I will. I, uh, you know, I, I think part of the, I'm, I want to, there's a short term and a long term, just kind of what, just to build on the conversation previously that I do want to raise is that part of the challenge and the nuance of, of this, the, of, of the conversation is that on some level, there's a level and element of truth of what the Republicans are saying. The truth of the matter is democracy has, as it has been in, enshrined in the constitution has never been realized. There's not been a pro-democracy movement, sustained pro-democracy movement in this country. Um, the closest to that 
has been, in my opinion, the only democracy movement has been the civil rights and the voting rights movement. But that's one element of democracy. And so there has been this, this, um, this message that America is democracy and people are now experiencing the fragility of democracy for the first time, particularly white citizens, that I remember even as, I, as we're doing the work, I'm often encountering them, that he can't do that, he can't do that. If you would talk And so um, I, I read that because I think that we are going to have to fundamentally not just continue to engage in this process that democracy just means participation. That ultimately what this is about is power. And the truth of the matter is while the Republicans have been bad actors because it is not in their vested interest, because there's a demographic shift, the Democrats have been complicit. That part of what we have seen is that we have gone in the districts where there are incumbents. If you go into incumbents districts, actually their voter turnout numbers are actually lower than in other districts of new. Why? Because what they're interested in is maintaining their power and they do so by getting the super voters and the voters that align with them. It is not in necessarily, and it's a risk to expand the uh, to expand democracy or expand bringing in new voters. So oftentimes in those places, what you see is you don't see a large voter turnout. There's a, there's a misconception around that. I raise that because I think it's important for us to... Latasha, I think I've lost you for a moment. So let me just go to Tomas for a quick minute. Uh, Tomas, I have a question um, that somebody has raised, which is what can Duke law students do to help with voting in North Carolina, especially if they're planning on returning to Durham this semester? I would, I would point to a couple of things. One is I, I would echo, I would echo Mirna's statement, right, which is uh, if you have any interest and availability in becoming a poll worker, uh, that, is, that is a great way in which you can make a difference. Um, you know, I, I don't know, to be very honest, about whether, you know, Durham is going to have major issues with poll worker shortages. I anticipate, actually, frankly, that it's going to be smaller and lesser resource parts of North Carolina that, that may have more of that issue than the larger and better resourced counties like Durham. Um, and so a second thing I would do is I would, I would plug the opportunity to potentially become a poll monitor. Democracy North Carolina runs a nonpartisan uh, uh, poll monitoring program as part of the National Election Protection Network. Uh, we're going to be deploying people. We're still determining, you know, the, safe, the safest way in order to do so, but we are making plans now to be, uh, to make sure that, you know, we've got a We've got people on the ground who can assist voters, monitor situations at polling sites so that people can get assistance and help in real time. So those are two things, two opportunities I would lift up. One is a poll worker, especially if you live outside of Durham, uh, or if the law changes in part through litigation, that changes the rule that you have to be from the county where you're a poll worker. Uh, and second would be highlighting our uh, poll monitoring opportunities. Great. You all, so we have about um, eight minutes left. So I want to use that time um, to help um, for you to tell us a little bit about why you do the work that you do um, and why do you think it matters. Uh, so this is an opportunity to speak um, to this audience to engage them in the work that you do. So I'm going to start with you, uh, Paul, then I'll go to Mina, then I will um, go to Tomas, and then uh, we'll close uh, with Latasha, depending on how much time we have. This might be our last question. So why do you do what you do, and why does it matter? Paul Smith. Well, thank you, Giddy. Uh, obviously, uh, making the democracy of this country work is central to the core values of a country. If we don't have that, then what are we? We're just, we're not the United States of America that was founded uh, with all all persons being equal. Uh, and so the opportunity to try to be on the, in the fight to make the country more democratic, to try to make it better rather than worse, uh, 
fighting against those forces that are trying to dis distort democracy for selfish purposes is really very rewarding. It's also extremely frustrating at times because the, uh, there are all sorts of, of forces out there that are trying to make us less democratic. Um, I spent a, a number of years litigating up to the Supreme Court cases about partisan gerrymandering, and that is an area where you just see this naked partisan advantage being stolen away from the people um, again and again. North Carolina being as the said a prime example, but not by any means the only one. Uh, and so I'm really hopeful that we can get to the point where some of these things can be reformed without having to fight them constantly in court. But in the meantime, uh, I'm doing what I'd I'm glad to be doing, particularly this year. This is an incredibly important uh, year for the country to, to get through this election, get an answer that feels legitimate to most of the country uh, and uh, keep the, the system operating against threats. We haven't even begun to talk about all the things that could go wrong on election day and, there, and thereafter, although Tomas hinted at it. But uh, th there's no more important place to be working right now than to try to, uh, to fight the, the anti-democratic forces every which way we can right now. And I hope you all get involved, <coughs> as I have, to, to, to do that. It's, this, is where, this is a really critical time period. It's not yeah, there. It is. Uh, the great historian, uh, civil rights historian Taylor Branch always refers to the, the vote as a little piece of nonviolence. Um, it is the way we resolve our political differences peacefully. Um, and I really love the idea that um, when you step into a ballot box, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, black or white, educated or not, that vote is supposed to count the same as everybody else's. Um, and I believe in the vote as a way of setting a direction for our country because the people that we elect through our vote uh, decide some very intimate aspects of our lives ranging from the kind of food we can put into our body to the quality of the air we breathe to what kind of school our children go to. Um, and I want to be in a position where I am making that choice. Um, uh, you know, I am a uh, woman of color, daughter of immigrants, and I am uh, acutely aware of the fact that not everybody in this world gets to enjoy um, some degree of self-determination. Um, and I don't trust anybody uh, to decide what's best for me and my family more than I trust myself. Um, and I want other mothers and other people to be able to make those decisions for them. So um, my, my, my goal and my hope is that other people will recognize uh, the importance of the right to vote, recognize that this country has already said, we've already made a promise in the 15th Amendment that when you step into the ballot box, you're going to be free from racial discrimination. And I want it to be my life's mission to uh, uh, educate, correct, and stop the people that haven't gotten on board with that. Because as far as I'm concerned, the country already decided this. And so we, we, we just need to stop. Uh, we need to, to make sure that we live up to that promise and that we live up to that ideal and that we earn it and protect it and guard it. Thank you. Thomas Lopez. Yeah, I, I became a public interest lawyer because uh, I had a lot of opportunities that my parents, when they came to New York from Puerto Rico, didn't get to have. And I uh, was very aware that many of the things that led me to have the opportunities that they didn't were systemic. And there was something not quite right. There were a lot of things that broke right for me. And I began my career as an immigrants' rights lawyer. Um, and it was very clear in, you know, working, you know, about a decade ago on, on those issues that many of the people who wanted to make life uh, harder or just outright miserable for immigrants were some of the same people who wanted to make voting harder for everyone, but especially black and brown people. And that there was a root fear about um, the direction of the country and who got to have a say. And that the fear was about people like me and my parents and my, you know, my, my family. And I thought that I thought, I just thought that this was, um, you know, this is just a great privilege to be able to, um, you know, 
fight on the right side. And um, it is, it, it's a work that can be frustrating in lots of ways, I think probably for reasons that have been explored in this conversation. Um, but I agree with the idea that it is, um, you know, so fundamentally important. Thank you. Natasha Brown, take us home. Why do you do what you do? Do we still have Latasha? We may not have Latasha. Let me just thank our, all of our panelists um, for um, a really riveting conversation on um, protecting the right to vote in the midst of a pandemic. Um, really appreciate all the suggestions that you all provided in terms of what we can do, the different types of remedies that are available to us. So thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with us this afternoon. Um, thank you to Professor Jones uh, for organizing this and to her students. Uh, really grateful for your leadership and your help. And we hope that everybody have, uh, has a safe, uh, wonderful afternoon. And thank you for joining us. Take care to everyone. Bye-bye.